Coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society, we gaze into our low-poly crystal balls to predict the Nintendo 64 Classic Edition. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellis, joined as always by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. Hey, how's it going? Good, Mark. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, yes, pretty good. Those are really large bananas. Thank you. <laughs> I got them from the Vons? Okay. I, I, I did the grocery shopping this week. Like it's- you, uh, dear listener, you of course cannot see these bananas, but the bananas I am beholding are enormous bananas. Would you say that behold is the only <laughs> verb you could have used? Yeah, I to, feel like... Because yeah. I feel like it has somewhat, like, religious connotations. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I feel like looking at... I mean, this banana, the one in particular, you have one of those contraptions that, like, there's a hook. Yeah, I mean, then, that's really all it is. Yeah, so, well, there, there's a bowl. <laughs> there's a basket under, under There's it, a yeah. basket underneath. Mm-hmm. And the banana stretches from the hook to the tip of the bowl. Yeah, no, it's a large banana. No one's no one's saying it's not a big banana. Have you had any from that bushel yet? Uh, yes. Are they good? They're, yeah, they're fine. Okay. Uh, I, I. It's interesting when you said, "Are they good?" Uh, my mind was like, "Is there such a thing as like a good banana?" Well, and that's one of the nice things about bananas is that there's a large window uh-huh. of where it's like fine. Fine. Yeah. Like I rarely, I don't know that I've ever eaten a banana and was like that was a good banana. Right. But there are bananas where you eat and you're like, oh, that's gross. Right. But the But for the most part, it's just it's like a it's a semi mushy continuum of fine. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I like eating bananas. <laughs> I don't know why I'm trash talking bananas right now. <laughs> Mark, we're not here to trash talk bananas. That's right. We are here because we think we know a thing or two about a Nintendo sixty four classic edition. That's right. So last year Nintendo put out the NES Classic Edition mm-hmm. in this year, in 2017, in just a few weeks, we're going to get a Super Nintendo. Very exciting. Classic Edition. Mm-hmm. Very exciting. And there have been some trademark applications and just a little bit of logic that leads us to believe that 2018 will hold a N64 Classic Edition. Okay. So that means that we have to predict what this thing is going to be. We have to. <laughs> and... Because we have to predict it. That's right. It, of course, means that we have to do one of our famous. Yeah, now famous. Now famous. Million dollar bets. Mm-hmm. Um, so whoever guesses closest. Yes. And we will decide what close entails. Yeah, I mean, I think like a general rule of thumb is like a point per game. Sure. Okay. Right? I think there, there are more dimensions to this than just what games are on this I thing. agree. Uh, so... We, we will uh, address it on a, a future episode, I, possibly years from now. So here's, here's my first prediction. Okay. okay? Um, so a lot of what we're basing uh, this whole segment on is that there was a uh, trademark filed for like the NES Classic kind of uh, controller uh, like logo, mm-hmm. one for the Super Nintendo and one for Nintendo 64. Um, and one for the Switch. And one for the Switch. Mm-hmm. Um, my honest prediction, like the one that I believe the most, uh-huh. is that those are just logos being registered for the eventual um, uh, virtual console, virtual console, and not necessarily for uh, new hardware. Okay, I don't think that we will see um, the Nintendo sixty four Classic Edition in two thousand eighteen. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Wait, is this the bold prediction that, uh, like, is this the we... earth-shattering news that? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got, I've got more. I've got another twist on this thing. Okay. Uh, beyond that, but we'll we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, because Mark... you texted me. Yeah. Being like, I can't wait to tell you. There's like a, I can't remember exactly how you phrased it. So I'm going to say you were, you said there's like a big twist or like something you'll never see coming or. That's right. Something like that. You like won't you're believe what happens next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I, w- I was writing clickbait headlines <laughs> and sending them to you <laughs> because that's how we communicate. Um, no, so uh, first, your thoughts on that. Do you think that this thing will be out, that there will be 
a class N64 Classic Edition in 2018? I really don't know. Because, uh, which is such like a weird <laughs> way to open this, like, we're going to talk about it. Right. But we're not sure it's going to exist. And the reason I don't know is because it stops making sense at a certain point. Yes. And the N64 is like the uh, kind of, I don't know. Yeah, like that's it. It is because, like, I I feel like GameCube is where it, it definitely doesn't make sense anymore, right? Um, and uh, yeah, the that the Nintendo sixty four is where I'm like, does it does it make like this is where um games start being first of all there are just like fewer games on the platform, um, and there's just like less third party support, and like some of the a lot of the big games are tied up in weird agreements and uh belong to other publishers and well, stuff. And also like so much of the N64 so many of my fond memories of the N64 are four player multiplayer based. Mm-hmm. And Nintendo is including two Super Nintendo controllers with the SNES Classic Edition, but the N64 controller is so much bigger and bulkier yeah. that at some point it doesn't make sense to pack two of them in. It definitely doesn't make sense to pack four of them in. So let's start there. Let's start with how many controllers does this system ship with? I say two. I also say two. Um, now, here, do, do you have a price point in mind? Uh, I, so from the NES to the... The NES was 60, the Super Nintendo is 80 i'm going with 120 oh okay so like a a big jump yeah um i'm i'm keeping it locked in at 80 oh wow um because i think more than 80 dollars and it it's no longer an impulse buy like it's something that you have to think about um like a hundred dollars isn't no money and not that 80 dollars is is no money but like yeah i think if you cross the 100 dollar mark there's definitely something psychological about seventy nine ninety nine versus one nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, for sure. Um, but so this is I'll, I'll throw out my my twist here. Okay. Mm-hmm. Here's my twist. Okay. My twist is two separate SKUs. Oh. So we every uh, the the two release the one that exists and the one that will exist shortly um, have all been you know like here is the thing you buy it it is all of the games but there have been. Uh, it, Famicom and and uh, regular NES and um, Super Famicom and Super NES, which means that Nintendo has already been doing two SKUs on these things, but they're divided by region and not uh, both available in in within a, a single region. Um, with the Nintendo 64, that's no longer a concern because we all got the Nintendo 64. Right. The design is the same. The design is, and the name is the same. Uh-huh. So there's no reason for like separate packaging either. Um, so. That's my bombshell, is that I think there would be two separate SKUs with completely separate game lists, one focused on single-player experiences and the other focused on multiplayer experiences. Both going for $80? Both going for $80, each one having 15 games on it, each having two controllers. Do I don't know that there are enough good multiplayer games or single-player games to... Okay. <laughs> oh, I guess like single player maybe, but like 15 multiplayer games. I'm not sure. I mean, you end up putting a couple Mario parties on there. <laughs> <laughs> but um so yeah, I I where I want to know what you did with Rare. So, if if we're making predictions here, are you assuming that r- the rare games will make an appearance? Rare, of course, was a studio that was were they owned by Nintendo at at one point, or were they just working closely with Nintendo? They were Nintendo had a either if not majority, but a very large financial stake in the company. So sure. they were partly owned by Nintendo. They were never wholly owned. Sure, um, and they developed a lot of um, Nintendo sixty four's biggest. Uh, and like most popular games, including you know Goldeneye and Banjo Kazooie, um, Perfect Dark, Killer Instinct, uh, a bunch Donkey of Donkey Kong games. 64, Donkey Kong 64, yeah. Um, and while we have seen a handful of those games appear on uh, Nintendo's like virtual consoles, like um, Donkey Kong 64 did, and there was a re-release of Diddy Kong Racing, um. You know, those are like I feel like if it falls under the Donkey Kong umbrella, that like Nintendo still owns it more than Rare does. Um, 
But like, what 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 do you end up doing with them? Do you think that we're gonna see them? On- so here, I um, I kind of like hedge my bets on this. Yeah, because w- when I was making my list of games, I think are going or it's like a list of things I think will be on there, but also a list of games that I want to be on there. Yeah, it's and, hard, it's hard not to do a little wish fulfillment in your predictions, right? And uh, it I it's also exclusively games that I have experience with mm-hmm. and also games that I like. So basically all the rare games from this generation yeah. are not on my list mm-hmm. because I you don't, don't like that. I don't like game. them. Right. Um the only one that did make my list is Goldeneye. And then I genuinely don't know if they like that's a deal breaker, kind of. I don't know that you can release an N sixty four classic edition and not have Golden Eye on there for the West. But it also seems like how do you get Golden Eye on there? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I really don't know because it's developed by a studio that it, Microsoft owns, and it's this IP that like Pro, like guaranteed. I think Activision owns at this point. Yeah. Um. So that would be a huge deal to get that thing. But yeah, it does seem like a deal breaker to not have it on yeah, there. Yeah, and they worked. A similar deal, kind of, in the Wii era. Yeah. To get a version of GoldenEye on the Wii. Um, so it's not impossible. And Nintendo and Microsoft have an okay working relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, they're partnering for some Minecraft stuff. And, and they, maybe that's it. <laughs> yeah, but they don't really... But I mean, you know, like, they've... It, I mean, this is in the past, but they put a uh, Viva Pinata game on the DS. And sure. You know, like, uh, they don't seem to have the same rivalry that Sony and Nintendo. Or Sony and Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I could, I think it's not impossible, but yeah. thorny for sure. Um, but I know you're more of a booster of Banjo-Kazooie yeah, and Diddy I like Kong Racing games. and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so wh- what did you end up doing with them? So I ended up uh, not including them on my main list and just having uh, having them as like, if if in a fantasy world I am allowing rare, then uh then they go on. However, um I do put Donkey Kong sixty four on the single player experience machine and Diddy Kong Racing on the multiplayer experience machine. Yeah, it's one of those things where like uh Donkey Kong I don't think Donkey Kong sixty four is a very good game, but I think it would a hundred percent end up on an actual machine. Absolutely. So it's not on my list, but it it you know, like it is. Right, because because it's, you it's guaranteed it to. to be there. Yeah. Um, well, let's 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 talk guarantees. Okay. Um, so I think that I think that maybe the only thing that we can say for certain is Super Mario sixty four. Yeah. On this thing, right? Yep. Um, how many games did you end up putting on on yours? I think I have around twenty, a little less than twenty. Okay. Um, yeah, but that includes like both Zeldas. Right. So here, the ones I think are guaranteed are definitely, yeah, Super Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, mm-hmm. and Super Smash Brothers. And yeah. the Zelda games. See, I think those are all locks. So this, the thing is, it's so weird, the different kinds of experiences on... And Star Fox 64. Six, yeah, Star Fox is another... So that's another six right one. there that I think are... Yeah. Uh, I would also say a, a lock is Paper Mario. I have that one on, yeah. Um, so, okay, let's, I, I don't really know how to steer the conversation here. Um, let's go through your list. Okay. Um, uh, so what, what, else, what haven't we mentioned yet? Okay, so my list is 1080 snowboard, snowboarding, mm-hmm. Animal Crossing. Okay, now, Animal Crossing, that's, that was just a Japanese release, right? On the Nintendo 64? Was it? I don't know. I, I thought the... I think you're right. I think the first mm-hmm. Animal Crossing was now that you say that so if there are separate SKUs for the east and west which there probably would be anyway just for um what games they would put on there i am certain that animal crossing would be on the japanese nintendo 64 classic edition now uh and if anybody's listening and knows for sure definitely shoot us an email but i think that the n64 version had like an arcade where you could play that may that may be the GameCube version. I know the GameCube version for sure has it. I wasn't sure if it was also in the N sixty four version. Sure, yeah, where you could play classic Nintendo games. Yeah, like yeah. the full version of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean the uh, the 
uh, NES port of um, Donkey Kong is in Donkey Kong 64. It's <laughs> you have to win it in order to get like a you know medal or something. So I also have Castlevania Legacy of Darkness. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I've got Castlevania 64 on mine. Okay. So Legacy of Darkness is the second one mm-hmm. that also included kind of like a remake of the first one in it. What? It was kind of like a oops, we're sorry about the first Castlevania. Right. Which is the most faithful 3D translation of classic 2D Castlevania. Stiff. Atmospheric. <laughs> <laughs> Hard. But it's not great, but it has a lo- it's but it has a lot of interesting ideas. Yeah. Um and I vastly prefer 2D Castlevania. Mm-hmm. Like Super Castlevania 4 is my favorite Castlevania game. And so I have a soft spot for the 64 uh, bit Castlevania games, even though they're pretty rough. Yeah. One thing that I think is interesting is there are there's no RPGs on my list other than Paper Mario, I don't think. Are there any on yours? I put Quest 64 okay. on mine, um, which is a game that I had um, and tried so hard to enjoy. But like, there aren't RPGs on this thing. So on my list, I feel like racing games have kind of replaced RPG. <laughs> so, because I have Cruise and World, mm-hmm. Mario Kart 64, F Zero X, and um, I think one more, or maybe I have Tony Hawk's Pro Skater on there. Uh, that's interesting. Why Tony Hawk? Because I have such fond memories of yeah. playing it, and I, I only we only owned the first one, so probably like two or maybe three is a better game. Yeah, but the first one is the one that I have the strongest memory of. Yeah, that's yours. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> um, so. I also have a bunch of racing games on on my uh, multiplayer SKU, including um, games that you mentioned. So uh, Super Mario Kart, or just Mario Kart, I guess, 64. Wave Race I have on there. I loved Wave Race. Um, That was one of those, like, uh, came out really early in the console's life cycle. And it was back when I had, like, that and Mario 64, and that was it. Um, So I feel like that's due for a comeback. Uh, Diddy Kong Racing uh, is also on my list, which again there are like some problems with like um both Conker and uh, Banjo are playable characters, and uh, they were removed in the 3D or no, the just DS. regular DS re-release. Yeah, um, F Zero X. Um, like you had, I also had Excite Bike sixty four on there, um, which I don't really have any experience with, but I like the Excite series. Um, and so, you know, I want an opportunity to play uh, the one from that generation. <laughs> um, so that seemed like a, as good a time as any. Now, here is also where I, I go out on a limb. I put uh, Star Wars Episode One Racer, the, the pod racing game on there. I put Star Wars Shadows of the Empire. So this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, because I also have Shadows of the Empire on my single player experience and um, Star Wars Rogue Squadron on the multiplayer one. Um, I think those are three good or good ish Star Wars games. Yeah, Shadows of the Empire isn't great, but for the time it came out, Mm -hmm. it was um, like an event. Yeah, well, and like, did you read Shadows of the Empire and collect the the action figures and stuff? I didn't collect the action figures, but I I did read the book. Yeah, so did I. (laughs) Like, it was a whole thing, right? Where like you just wanted to have this whole experience. Well, and it was like, a new story in the Star Wars like film universe, right? And we were in the previous episode. We were talking about ranking the pre- prequels. I'd put Shadows of the Empire above all three of them. <laughs> the video game or the book? I don't know. The whole experience. The whole experience. <laughs> yeah. Also collecting the action figures. Like it's all part of it. Um. So that like that's one of my like wish list things, or like one of the more stretch goals is like I think it'd be cool if they got the Star Wars licensed games. Um actually, to, to come out on the Nintendo 64 Classic. Yeah, I, I guess the fact that it, none of the, uh, like, Super Star Wars, Super Empire Strikes Back, uh, Super Return mm-hmm. of the Jedi show up on the uh, SNES Classic. Suggests that we wouldn't see that. Yeah. I, I hear that, but also, like, those games I don't think are as important to the Super Nintendo's library as Shadows of the Empire was to the Nintendo 64's library, right? Um, like, 
not having shadows on on this thing all is almost the same as not having Goldeneye. Um, like they're both big important games and like moments on on those machines. Um, it's so weird that <laughs> probably won't be able to work out work that out legally. Now, do you think they'll both Ocarina and Majora's Mask, both Zelda and sixty four Zelda games mm-hmm. would show up here? Um, I would say yeah. Um, if for no other reason than like they're both such well regarded games. Yeah, I don't feel like you can omit one. Yeah, it would be a problem, right? Um, and also if you omit one, that's just not Majora's Mask, right? Like you, I don't think you can put this machine out without putting Ocarina of Time. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, is it weird to you at all that uh so many of the so many of the games that we're talking about um. Ex- there exist versions of these games that are better and more playable for uh, Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and Star Fox that like you can play all of these games in better formats right now that are like cleaner and like I think it would be difficult to convince myself to play Majora's Mask on a Nintendo 64 Classic well, I also think, honestly, I think that's true for Mario Kart 64. Yeah. You know, I mean, even though Mario Kart 64 is its own experience that yeah. I have a lot of fond memories with, it's hard to go back to. Yeah. Like, the sense of speed is really slow. Uh, I have great memories of the Skyscraper multiplayer map. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I don't think it would age all that well. No, and like... Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I actually think a lot of these games age a lot worse than w- we th- like expect them to. Definitely. Um, like just you know, people hadn't they had developers hadn't figured out how to like move around in three D space yet. The controller has a single; <laughs> it has a single analog stick. You well, know, well, like, not just not just that, but like, uh. M- I feel like much more so than pixel art, these graphics would look terrible on a huge screen. Absolutely. Like, real bad. (laughs) There's no cleaning it up. Like, the more you clean it up, the worse it looks. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like the uh, PlayStation N64 era is, like, the worst-looking era of game. I I agree. (laughs) And so, yeah, I, I don't know how you get around that. Yeah, and ugh. blown up to like sixty inches. It's <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It's not going to be a good time. Like there, even even as we're like talking our way through what we're like, I predict this, but it's also sort of my fantasy version of the machine. I don't know if I want it. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely buy it. I would buy it too. I would. De- I don't know how much I would, how much use I would get out of it. Because mm-hmm. yeah, I feel like these games have aged, maybe like. Yeah, like pretty poor, generally yeah. speaking, and there and the classics have been cleaned up. Like you know, mm-hmm. the games that we want to play from this era, for the most part, have all been remastered. Right, and you know, the, I guess there are a handful that haven't. What that would be interesting, right? If they did a Nintendo sixty four classic that did not include games that have been remastered. So. I mean, that would be no Zeldas, no Mario, and no Star Fox, um, and kind of no Mario Kart. Yeah, I guess the Mario Kart, oh, sorry, uh, Super Mario 64 DS is kind of cleaned up. Not really. I, I don't know that it's an improved yeah, version of the game. That's a good point. In any, like, real measure. Yeah, and again, it suffers from um, uh, not really having the good right controls. inputs for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask you this: uh, the controllers themselves, be they uh, two or one or four packed in, um, do they have rumble packs? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm-hmm. I feel like they would have to for like the Star Fox sixty four experience, right? Because otherwise, you're not really playing Star Fox sixty four, really. Yeah, I've so that's that's uh, part of my prediction as well that they all have uh, rumble packs, um, even though I don't. I think there were a lot of games that did not utilize it. Definitely. I definitely think so, especially because it was just uh, an accessory that you would buy separately and like put into the back of the controller. Right. Or was came packed in with, <laughs> with Starbucks. Yeah. Um, so, 
as part of my uh, like single player experience machine, I started to put Pokemon games on this thing. Oh, okay. Um, because there are, to my mind, like three big Pokemon games on the Nintendo 64: Pokemon Snap, Pokemon Stadium, and Hey You Pikachu. Um, and Hey You Pikachu had a uh, like microphone attachment that plugged into the back of the Nintendo 64 controller. So, <laughs> one of these controllers, I predict, would have that microphone on it, so you could talk to your Hey You Pikachu. <laughs> I couldn't figure out a way uh, that would make sense for Stadium to be on, on this thing. So, the, the original Pokemon Stadium came with, again, another thing that you slapped into the back of the Nintendo 64 controller, and then you put your Pokemon cartridge into the back of it and then you could battle your pokemon against your friends pokemon in like a 3d like really all it was was a a place for you to battle your existing pokemon right and to see pokemon in 3d yeah um which the game boy could not do <laughs> um but I, I like i can't there's no way to i mean first of all people aren't playing that game anymore r- red and blue and yellow um but also just, like, there, there's no way to recreate that part of the experience. Well, and that's partly why I have it more expensive, like $120, is because just like the things we've been mentioning, comparatively, the NES Classic Edition and the SNES Classic Edition are easy. Yeah. Right? Because they're just the machine and two controllers, and that's it. It doesn't require anything else. Once you get into the N64 era, you are talking about maybe including accessories or excluding those games or, or just putting the, out the a version controllers of, themselves. Right. Or like putting out a version of, yeah, the controllers themselves are more complex. Um, but it's just hard for me to imagine them putting out a N64 Classic Edition without Star Fox 64. But I also can't imagine them putting out Star Fox 64 without there being Rumble. Right. And that's an added, like, do you build the Rumble? into the n64 controller do you have the slots in the back you know like it's right. just and all does, these new complications does that fundamentally change the experience too like the fact that the rumble pack is sticking out you know two inches from the back of the controller like that changes where you're getting that feedback from right right um if that's if you're feeling it like actually in your in your hands that's going to be different um so yeah, I don't know. I almost feel like th- this thing can't be done. Well, and also... There are too many hurdles, Mark. <laughs> you would also have to retrain yourself mm-hmm. to hold the N64 controller because we're used to holding uh, like Super Nintendo controllers. Yes. And by proxy, we're used to holding NES controllers. Right. But like we've moved so far away from what the N64 controller was right. and how it controlled. Like, I think going back to one analog stick is going to be difficult. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's so weird that like if you were to make if you were to make this machine, you would have to you would have to release the controller as it is even though no one ended up using that D-pad, right? right. Like um you know, I've got uh, Turok Dinosaur Hunter on my uh, single player one, and like that's how you switch over to like bow and arrow or something, <laughs> or like over to a knife, um, is by tapping that thing, or maybe it's how you run something. There was some dumb functionality that it had, um, that like it's just so it's a worthless like appendage of this controller, and you would just like have to keep it because that's what it looks like, even though you're manufacturing new <laughs> hardware. <laughs> uh, one game that I do have on here. Purely for the fact that Waluigi was introduced in it is Mario Tennis. I also have Mario Tennis. Uh, it's a good game. Yes, I but, agree. But Waluigi was because I was like, uh, oh, do you put like golf on here? Do you put one of the Mario parties? And I ended up going with uh, tennis. Um. Well, and and again because I have uh you know two different console lineups here. Um. Uh. I have Mario Tennis and Mario's Mario Parties two and three. Um, on my on the multiplayer experience one yeah it seems like you would at least have to have i don't have it on here because i didn't play enough of any of them Mm -hmm. in the n64 era to really have an opinion on them but it seems like you would have to have one of the mario parties on there did you play a lot of mario party yeah so i played a lot of uh mario parties one and two um and two had or one sorry had um games where you just needed to rotate the analog stick as fast as you can um 
And like the fastest way to do it was to like plant your palm on the controller and just like swivel it around. Um, but the skin on your palm is a lot more fragile than the skin on your thumb. <laughs> so you would wear through and like, I remember my friends bleeding playing this thing, right? Um, but also that's a, a short trip to a broken controller. Well, that's the other thing with these controllers. They're fragile. The the analog stick is especially. Mm-hmm. I remember ours would become very like loose yeah. almost. Yeah. Yeah. I don't this this whole thing's a mistake, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they should do it. Yeah, we've kind of I don't it's so complicated. Yeah. That I don't that I it seems like it the amount of work it would take to make it like functioning is yeah. such a headache. It's it's such a headache. And really if you don't have a solution figured out for the controller, the like number of controllers, um, I don't know how you market this thing. Cause like uh, the Super Nintendo uh, Classic has both the controllers packed in. You're great from 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 the jump. The um, NES, you couldn't find the extra controllers, right? Right. Like, it seems like they learned from their mistake, right? In that regard, and so they were like, "We fixed it for the Super Nintendo." But like, if you're not just selling four controllers with the thing, it's it's impossible. Like you're sentencing anyone to someone buying it to not being able to play it four player which is partially why i've i have this like two skew thing because then if you want all 30 games you buy two versions of this machine and then you've got two controllers in each one you've got four controllers yeah um and yeah then it means you've spent 160 dollars on it but if you just want the single impulse buy you can spend 80 bucks and have a machine that plays ocarina of time so one thing that we've talked about in the past on other episodes and I think is re- relevant here is like the love that people have for the N64. Yeah. Even though it's kind of a weird like island of misfit toys system, it's one that people hold like really dear to their hearts mm-hmm. like and have a lot of fond memories of. Even I would say more so and it's also came at the perfect time where people who are younger than you and I still have for them, for a lot of them, it'll be their first Nintendo system. Yeah. Or it'll be just one generation before their first Nintendo system. So, like, their older siblings or cousins or whatever will have played it. Yeah. Um, and so I almost wonder if... I think the, N- the NES Classic Edition that b- was huge, partly because the NES holds a strong place in a lot of people's hearts. Right. I feel like... And just kind of like in gaming history. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like even though you and I are really... And a lot of people are big on the Super NES, I don't think the NES Classic or the NES or the SNES in general holds that same kind of cultural cash. Yeah, agree. Totally. And I, I think that the Nintendo 64 is another step down from that. Oh, you think so? I see, Yeah, I do. See, I think that it you would... You think that's where like an upswing happens? I think it would only happen for nostalgic reasons. Yeah. I think in obviously in real life, the N64 was another step down sales-wise. Mm-hmm. But I think more people have fond memories of playing the N64 with friends than they do the Super Nintendo. So I think if Nintendo was able to figure this out and make a uh n64 classic edition that it would sell really really well oh that's so interesting i mean you had the experience of of buying a actual n64 like 10 years after it was released or something yeah something this, there. yeah so th- this was maybe like seven or eight years ago when i was living in chicago um that i bought one at a, a store called people play games um in wrigleyville and walking back to my apartment with it um, I was stopped by like four or five people just to be like, whoa, you get it? You just buy a Nintendo 64? Like strangers who wanted to talk to me about this thing. So, I mean, maybe you're right. Maybe there is. I think if you were walking around with a Super Nintendo, you wouldn't necessarily get the same reaction. Yeah, probably not. Especially because the N64 is so distinctive. Yeah. Well, so that that is actually another thing that feeds into my um, wanting to see two different SKUs of it is that when I close my eyes to picture a, a NES or a Super Nintendo, I know exactly what it looks like. It looks like one thing to me. But the Nintendo 64, do you see the solid black one or the like see-through purple one? I see the solid black one because that's the one we owned. But I see a see-through orange controller because that's the one that's most, you know, like in like see-through red. Yeah. Because there were so many different colors and versions of them that yeah. like the plain gray one 
I I guess we owned one, but I can't really remember it. Yeah, that's right. Like right when it launched, there were uh, individual colors of controllers um, that weren't just the the standard gray. I know I know I had one. I think that was my main. But like, yeah, definitely had a red one and a green one, and I think a yellow one eventually. Actually, now that we're talking about it, I think we had the see through purple <laughs> console. I don't think we had a regular one. So the even the iconography here is hard, right? Yeah. Like, what does it look like? I mean, the shape of it is distinct. The shape of it is distinct. It's got those like feet almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like it's like wavy. Mm-hmm. I don't know, Mark. I don't know. I feel like in our previous episode, we talked ourselves into ranking the Phantom Menace lower than I I had originally thought we were going to mm-hmm. because as we were talking, it was like, oh, yeah. And now that we're into this, I don't know that N- N64 Classic Edition makes any sense. It, I, I don't think it makes any sense, um, especially if you can't get rare games on this thing and especially if you can't get Star Wars on it right like i think those are the two big hurdles get star wars on it get rare games on it somehow get golden eye on it yeah i feel like golden eye is a deal breaker that's like the one like weird it's not really third party but at this point kind of is third party yeah that you would have to get Mm -hmm. everything else like i mean you could fill it with pilot wing 64 you could fill it with like the kirby game you could you know like nintendo could mostly pad out an n64 with only first party games but goldeneye's got to be on there yeah i mean especially the thing that's so weird is that like if anyone who is excited about goldeneye spent 10 minutes with goldeneye they'd be like why am i (laughs) why did i spend any money on this right like it's not going to be a rewarding experience for anyone who uh has fond memories of early first person shooters right like um we did not they did not know how to make those games play on controllers yet halo had not happened yet you know and it's a weird controller it's a weird controller yeah so maybe the maybe the n64 classic edition is yeah better left better left (laughs) right which brings me back to my original prediction that uh the trademark uh, logo that we saw does not refer to hardware it refers to software that we can expect to see on the switch so that is the that is my my sincere entry for the million dollar bet and it makes a lot of sense but because i'm a contradictory person Mm -hmm. i of course will take that million dollar bet yes i predict those four logos are not for some sort of virtual console on the switch um let's see uh, if there's anything else on here that we uh haven't mentioned yet you know we didn't mention pilot wings yeah i don't have pilot wings on um either of my either of my lists i don't either it's not a game that i owned and i have no fond memories of any pilot you know like i don't any pilot yeah pilot wings like i didn't like the super nintendo one either is uh is does the super nintendo classic have pilot wings on it oh I don't, so. I don't think it does. If it that, I, that seems like a wasted space. Um, I don't think it's a very good game. I've got it on my uh, 3DS, and every time I'm like, oh, I should spend a little time trying to figure this game out, uh, and then I realize that it is impenetrable and not fun. <laughs> <laughs> so if <laughs> And you don't think that translated well to 3D graphics? Probably not. Um, if you've got fond memories of Pilot Wings, be it uh, vanilla or 64, please write into us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. Um, I do have uh, Yoshi's Story on my single player experience list. Not as good as um, Yoshi's Island, but. Uh, you know, I think goes a long way towards establishing like the current Yoshi aesthetic. Um, for better and for worse. For better and for worse, for sure. Um, but like an an important game. Um, again, th- all these games that I'm like, this is an important game. I don't want to revisit it. Yeah, I think that's a big problem. Okay, so we're just saying, don't do it. Right? Yeah, I think so. Nintendo don't do it. I mean, I'm open to alternative opinions, but I just don't see how it's feasible. And I don't see how it'd be very much fun. All the, like all the good games on here have superior versions. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Even like Super Smash Brothers, Mario Kart, 
Mario Tennis. You oh, know, yeah. like all So that's that we barely talked about uh Smash on here, but that's another one that like I think if you were excited about Smash originally on the Nintendo 64, you've been with the series through so many evolutions that like it doesn't make sense to go back and play it. There are eight characters in that game. Yeah, it does have the best version of Pikachu. <laughs> like it's the most powerful version. Yeah, he's OP, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, they're, they're Fire Emblem characters. <laughs> and now that's all the game is. <laughs> <sighs> all right. Uh, so that I, I think that that's where we land is um, don't do it, Nintendo. <laughs> yeah. Um, if anyone, I, I, I'm genuinely curious. Like, if someone thinks they have this thing figured out, um, we would love to hear uh, what your lists for these things would be. How many controllers do you think would come packed in it? What's an acceptable price point? Um, I mean, Mark, you've got yours at 120. Yeah. Would you buy one of these for 120? I would because I'm a dummy. Yeah. You know, like I would never yeah. play it, but I would buy it so I could have it. Right. So you would just put it on the shelf. That for like the rest little of like N6, and I'm I would plug it in once, and mm-hmm. you know, like like you're saying, play Goldeneye for a few minutes, and then be like, oh, this is not that much fun. Yeah. Let me ask you this. I'm gonna flip it all around. Uh, what if instead of being a uh, machine that tried to get at all of the different kinds of experiences. What if it was just a single player system, right? So it was just, it just had um, Zelda, Mario, Zelda again, maybe uh, Star Fox, Paper Mario, and a couple other like single player games, maybe like 10. One controller, one controller port, really low price point. Yeah, I would totally do that. I would totally... That's almost more appealing to me than all of these kind of broken multiplayer experiences. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I would do it to play through Paper Mario alone because yeah. I think that game has aged really well. Yeah, well, it's adorable. Um, it's got really nice graphics um, and the writing is smart. And it's kind of the beginning of that like smart Mario writing of like that sense of humor. Um, yeah, I mean, it might even just be worth it for Paper Mario alone. Like a dedicated Paper Mario machine that looks cute. Oh yeah, yeah, for like fifty bucks. Yeah, I'd be I'd be into that because nothing else makes sense. Like if <laughs> if 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 there was just like uh, a thing that was just four controller ports and you know it's a piece <laughs> of plastic with four controller ports and it had uh you know cart and smash and uh, golden eye and perfect dark um that wouldn't be a fun machine to play. I don't think. Yeah, I agree. Um, but again, if, <laughs> if, if you have this thing worked out and you know exactly, uh, what it should be, email us at Nintendo cartridge society at, at gmail.com. Gmail. Um, all right. That's going to do it for this episode of the show. If you like, uh, how do I end the show? Uh, if you enjoyed the show, please, uh, share, tweet about it, um, or share it on Facebook. Uh, that stuff always helps us out. Um, our Twitter handle is at Nin Cart Society. Facebook page is just Nintendo Cartridge Society. If you like Mark and Mind's opinions, you can read our discussions of comic books at retcompunch.com. Olivia Duncan made our logo, and our music is composed and performed by 8 Bit Betty. Uh, and you can check out his music by going to 8bitbetty.com or by listening right now. For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Ellers saying thanks for listening. What's a creative podcast network? Hi guys, I'm Julia Meltzer. I want to tell you about my show on the What's a Creative Network. It's called Honey. Um, On Honey, I interview real couples about how they fight, what they fight about, how they got over it. It's basically like if you've ever seen a couple almost get into a fight at a dinner party or something, and you wish you could be like, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, like what is that really about? Um, That's the conversation we get to have on Honey. Um, So check us out. Uh, subscribe to Honey on the What's a Creative Network. Uh, we're on Instagram and Twitter at Honey with Julia. We're on Facebook at Honey with Julia Meltzer. And I hope to be seeing you soon.